why don't you go ahead and give the cards uh, here to Bella and uh, with the pen. Bella, if you'll s- want to sign it and pass it on and make its way through. Thank you, Sophia. You can go to, to class now. Appreciate that. She was so excited to want to be a, a part and help out, and uh, I'm not going to discourage that, that's for sure. So, uh, so yeah, uh, it comes to you, even if you don't know him, just know he is a good man of God, and he needs as much encouragement as possible. So please give it to him. Uh, I want you to also, we're going we're gonna to sing here uh, number 676, Living for Jesus, um, at the end of all of this. So you're full now. <coughs> Hopefully what I can do for you today is get you into the idea of gluttony because uh, <laughs> I'll fill you up some more. How's that sound? All right. All right, so <coughs> we're going to talk about one thing today. So that's good, right? We're going to talk about one thing, and then we can, we can have lunch and come back together for, for a time of, uh, of encouragement afterwards as well. Uh, as we talk, uh, we, we, we spent a little extra time talking about this one thing. So one of the things, and I know some people don't like this, some others are, are okay with it, but it does, uh, you know, one of the things about public speaking is to get people behind you is to make them laugh, right? So you wonder why so many uh, preachers open with a joke. Um, and uh, hopefully what they open up with is has something to do with what they're going to be talking about. Um, and so, uh, so there is, uh, maybe, maybe you'll get this idea once I tell you this, you know. Why did the chocolate chip cookie go to the doctor? Because it felt crummy. <laughs> but the doctor had good news. He said, I just had one thing to prescribe to you, a glass of milk. The cookie looked skeptical. And he said, a really, just one thing? Doctor said, yes, sometimes one thing is all it takes to make us feel better. Well, the cookie smiled and said, well, in that case, I guess I'll have to put all my chips in the milk. <laughs> all right. Are you on my side now? All right. Good. <laughs> Are you ready to throw me out? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about one thing here, and it goes into Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to start here. Luke chapter 18, there is a uh, follow-up verse in Matthew, uh, chapter in Matthew that we're, we're not going to go over right now, but we will uh, reference it later on. Luke in chapter 18, starting in verse 18. Let's be standing in honor of the Word of God this morning as we read out loud here, as we already have there, thank you very much, brother, for reading that for us. But Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, talking about asking Jesus, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? If you're <coughs> that reference back to Matthew, he actually asks this question in Matthew 19, verse 16. He says, He says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? All right. Referencing back to Luke chapter 18, verse 8 and 19 now. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, oh, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, still you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. With this example from, from uh, the life of Christ as he is dealing with so many people who desire to, to maybe want to do the right thing through God, but you know what? They want to do an alter, go an alternate way to do it. And I, I just pray, dear God, that each one of us here in our heart and our mind and our attitude and in in, in every 
be, every bit of our being is desirous to do and work for you and not just play off uh, the things in this world, but Lord God, that we can put our everything towards you. So I pray that you just help us to understand this one thing that we could be uh, missing or, or one thing that we need to, to really build us up in you. And God, I just pray that you give me wisdom as I speak this morning. Open our ears and our hearts to your word. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So, <coughs> as we understand from here, the rich man forgot one thing. There was one thing that he was missing. And let's, but, but <coughs> let's reel back here a little bit. Let's go back and let's kind of just, just, just explore the life of the rich man. Now, there's not a whole lot stated about the rich man here, uh, but there are some things that we can maybe garner from his life. Well, first of all, we can tell that he was a devout Jew. He was very devout. He went along. He, 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 prob- he went to synagogue. He, he, he kept the commandments. Here he says in verse 19, Jesus lists off some of these commandments. And he says, well, I've kept all these from when I was a very young man. From my youth, I did all this stuff. So we know he was very devout. We know he was very wealthy because it says that. And so because you're wealthy, you tend to have lots of friends, right? You tend to have lots of stuff. Uh, uh, You want to know who your real friends are? Some poor. But uh, when you you become rich, you get lots of friends. And so he was very wealthy and probably had lots of stuff. Verse 22 says he had great possessions. And so whatever those great possessions of the time were, you know, we have uh, golden K-rigs, K-rigs here that you can buy, diamond-encrusted uh, uh, phone cases if you're rich enough. I don't know what that means by being rich back then. Maybe he had two goats instead of one. <laughs> you know, he was the man because he had great possessions. He liked Jesus. He liked Jesus, and he was very active in going and know, knowing who Jesus was. In fact, he, he, he went up to Jesus and he said, good teacher. Well, you don't say that unless you really want to get on the side of a good teacher, right? And so he <laughs> knew who Jesus was. He probably thought that he had some great words of uh, wisdom as he had been, Jesus had been talking for quite a while now. <coughs> Excuse me. But sometimes in life, it's not what is mentioned, but what is not mentioned that we should be thinking about. And so you, you read an obituary, and you could probably read an obituary of a mass murderer and think, hey, this was a pretty good guy. Because nobody's going to put in that obituary <coughs> that he was a terrible person. So it's not always what is mentioned that you should wonder about, but what is not mentioned that I want to bring out to you. The thing is, is that he was looking for something physical. Really physical, that would get him into heaven. This is the common problem that we have in the world, that even those who do not follow Christ, who get an inkling of good things of God, think that maybe their good stuff will outweigh their bad stuff, and that God will be able to smile upon them and say, all right. But that's not, oh, so thank you very much. <coughs> but that's not how it is. And he says, uh, Matthew, in Matthew, uh, we were looking at Matthew 19, verse 16. He asks the question, what good thing shall I do to have eternal life? See, he probably went his whole life being able to buy his way into prestigious things. He probably had the best seat in the synagogue. He probably had the best seat in the playhouse where he was at. He probably, when people walked, uh, when he walked along uh, the streets with his procession, people were able to look at him and says, "See that man? I want to be just like him. I want everything that man has." So he, wherever he went, whatever he did, he was the man. 
But you know, Jesus never even acknowledges to this man about the good thing that he needs to do to get into eternal life. Rather, Jesus uses his good teacher to, to help others that are around, to help them to recognize, hey, why do you call me good? Because no one is good but God. And Jesus uses that as an opportunity to show his deity because if he is a good man, if he is a good teacher, the only one good around is God, and that's him. Something that would escape the rich man as he was only interested in what affects him. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And it's still a question that even Christians ask. And it's hard something to get away from, isn't it? Am I not good enough? Am I good enough? What, what could I do s- stronger or, or, or not? Maybe I'm doing a good job. And, you know, it's just something that even crush, Christians uh, 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 struggle with, to think about what good thing. There was uh, somebody was telling me... <coughs> Uh, a preacher had died, and his wife was not sure if he was going to be in heaven or not because he forgot to read his Bible that morning. But that's exactly what the rich man was saying. What good thing should I do? That's not how it works. The rich man equated doing good works for God as be- and being wealthy as equals. And so if you're wealthy, therefore you must be a good person enough to get into heaven. Because if you don't have wealth, well then, there's something you're doing wrong. That attitude is still around today. The health and wealth gospel is still being preached in a strong, strong way. And people believe it. You watch it on, the, you watch it on YouTube, and you'll see these people reaching into their pockets, throwing dollar bills onto, the, <coughs> onto the, the sanctuary where the guy is, hoping that that one dollar bill will turn into a million. And they're taken down a wrong path to destruction. And those people who preach that gospel are the ones leading them to their own destruction as well. In fact, Jesus says, blessed are the poor (laughs) because why shall inherit the kingdom of God so (coughs) wealth does not dictate to being a good man enough for heaven I'll tell you that but did you also notice that Jesus left out five commandments so he goes about this (coughs) He goes about this, and he says, hey, look at these things. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not bear false witness. Honest, honor your father and mother. What is left out of those, of those ten commandments? The first five. And so he talks about here about <coughs> the things that you do towards others leaving out totally the things that you do towards God. See, Jesus questions the the rich man's real story, (coughs) and that is dedication. Dedication to who? Romans, or Psalms chapter 7, verse 9 says, For the righteous God tests the hearts and minds of people. Christ puts it in his court, and the rich man didn't even blink about what was left out. Christ probably was wondering if even this righteous rich man would even figure it out. Was what the rich man doing in real life for God or for someone else? Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, all that section right there, there are a lot of people coming up saying, did we not do this in your name? Did we not do great things in your name? Did we not become the man for you? 
And God said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And that's the road this rich man was on. And through it all, it never dawned on the rich man that his whole world was being questioned. That's called being oblivious. You want to be a person for God? Somebody comes up to you and wants to discuss something with you? You open your mind and your brain and your ears, not your mouth, and you listen, and then you discuss. Too many times we're, 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 we get on the defensive, and I'm telling you, it's one of my weaknesses. I get to be the one of the most defensive people, and I don't know why. It just um, uh, instant, It's an instantaneous thing. It's the one thing I need God to really work on me <coughs> on is, is, is not getting so defensive. And the fact is, is that this man, it, it, too many people were, were going to get defensive saying, hey, you think I did something wrong, didn't you? Rather than thinking about what they might be telling you or just discussing with you. Maybe it's an issue they have, not you. And maybe they think you've got it figured out. And so that's why they're coming to you. But this whole rich man's world was crashing down. And Romans chapter 3, verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. So this whole man, his, his whole world crashed down, and he was oblivious to his own sin. So... <coughs> What really kept the rich man from heaven? See, his possessions were his God, and he was its disciple. That's why the first five were left out. Because the Bible, the Ten Commandments, the very first one, you shall have no other gods before me. And yet, it's exactly what the rich man had. A God other than the Creator. And so, this whole thing, the rich man was oblivious to. But here's the deal. All of it. It's a good story. We understand. We get it. We've heard, we've heard the, the stuff of the rich man before. But I want us to consider or remember our one thing. I want you to consider who called you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 26, verse 27 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. I was thinking about this, actually, in our Sunday school. A and, and you brought up a, a, really, a, a really good discussion, brother. I, I really appreciated that. The fact is, is that <coughs> for the longest time, and, and, and it was true, I, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was something, I, I mean, years and years and decades ago, but, but it was a time I thought, hey, how can you prove something without, you know, try to prove something to somebody who doesn't know the God, God's word? But I don't want to, you know, God's word is my sword. You can't go into battle without a sword. You can't go into battle easing into the sword. Because we have a different battle going on, don't we? Our battle is not with flesh and blood. Our, so we go straight into the battle with the sword. Not gradually, because eventually... <coughs> We might forget it someday. But the world needs to hear the sword. The world needs to know its power. See, unlike the rich man who had all things to comfort him and to help him think he was okay in God's eyes, you are called to something greater. We are. I love it. You look at some examples we have. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. 
Moses himself makes a, a, a <coughs> he, he says, God, I, I, I don't speak very well. I'm a, I'm a stutterer here. And you know what? God uses him, <coughs> a stutterer. And led a nation from the grips of the only superpower around. Our God is greater than even the superpowers of the world. You look at Paul, weak in appearance and not a great speaker. As he talks about it, some people were com- uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. <coughs> and he says here, he says, um, For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And so some people were thinking that Paul himself was not much to look at. Well, you get beaten a few times and shipwrecked and and everything else and see how you look. (laughs) All right. But the fact is, is that he probably was not the best looker, maybe not even the best speaker, but he had the word of God behind him. One person remarked that Paul was bald, blind, and single. And yet, through his efforts, God at the helm, he brought, he brought peace. He brought, he brought a sword. He brought a lot of things to the world that needed to hear the message of the gospel. And we were willing to do it despite the fact that he was bald, blind, and single. He did powerful stuff as a single man. You're single, and you want to change that? Well, guess what? Maybe God will. But what are you doing now while you're single? I want us to be sure of our calling. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, says, uh, verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure. For if we do these things, you will never stumble. So what is he talking? He talks, he's talking about, for if you do these things. Well, if you look there in 2 Peter in chapter 1, he says here to add a few things. He <coughs> and this is what you add so that you do not stumble. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse uh, in chapter 1, he says, but add faith to virtue. To virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness. You add these things and you keep adding these things in your life with God's help. And he says here, you will make your calling and election sure if you are willing to do these things. (sighs) I'm lazy. I don't want to do these things. Well, guess what? Your calling and election will not be sure if you're not willing to add these things. Some can add them quickly. Some will add them slowly. But add. Keep working at it. Keep grinding on. With God's help, we can persevere. It's about dedication. Do not let one thing hinder your faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. And he has that, and, uh, people seem to agree that Paul was, uh, probably had cataracts. And his eyes were dim. And he says, I ask God day and night to take this away from me. Maybe it might have helped in his own mind for the gospel. But Paul, but Paul was forgetting that it was, his power came through God. And it, God himself said, no. For when you are weak, I am made strong in you. And so sometimes this, these, there are things that, that are going to come along and they're going to, what you think, trip you up. But you might not understand that what you think is tripping you up is making you stronger. Refined by the fire. And you never know who's looking at you seeing you persevere and say, I want that. It's through God that we persevere, but we have, to remi- we, we have to rely on him as Paul did, even despite him not being able to see and being bald, blind, and single. See, he had a lot of stuff, but really it was about not being able to see. 
But Paul himself seemed to have a struggle, struggles of dedication at one time in his life. And he says here in Romans chapter 7, verse, uh, starting in verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what, what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. There was a time where I used to think that this was maybe Paul's struggle even in his Christian life. But I actually have moved on from that because Paul's talking here is about how sin dwells in him. But if you continue on into Romans chapter one verses one and uh, chapter eight verses one and two, it says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, it was the Spirit now dwells in Paul, not sin. And so now I understand this was Paul's former life. He realized and understood that he was at one time, his, even in his supposed dedication to God, just like this rich man, his supposed dedication to God was of not because in the end sin dwelled in him and he was not doing the things of God, because it was him doing it. He, he, he totally, even despite the fact that I believe in God, but in reality, it was sin was destroying him. But he says, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We have no condemnation now. We have the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God dwells in you, <laughs> you are His. If the Spirit of God is not in you, I implore you today to fix that situation and realize that it is the Spirit of God that needs to be in you. You need to dedicate your life to Christ and be buried in the grave of baptism. What might be the one thing that is hindering you from fully serve, for being fully in the service of God? And I believe it's a fair question to ask ourselves in light of a rich man who seemingly was also a devout religious man. See, this is why we are told to examine ourselves as whether to whether we are in the faith. Test yourselves that Test yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you. And see, there is an answer to this test. It's not one of those open-ended tests where you've got to be uh, philosophical about that, not, that there is no right answer. There is a right answer. And so he, sa he, says, in, says, he says here in, in verse 6, he says, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Paul understood the answer to the test. He tested himself to see if he was in the faith, trusted God, and now he says, I am not disqualified. See, that is confidence in the Spirit of God that is in him and in you. Growing closer to God will require dedication. But you are not alone in this. Psalm chapter 91, verses 1 and 2 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God and Him I will trust. So are you dwelling in the secrets of the place of the Most High? Is there one thing that is hindering you from serving God fully? Or is there some encouragement we can give you that you that <coughs> will help you in not getting discouraged in your serving? What can we do as a church? Not just I, but what can we do as a church to encourage you? Because we do not wish you to become hindered. There was a young man who went to a wise old preacher and said, Preacher, I want to dedicate my life to serving God, but I am not sure what I am supposed to do. What's the one thing I need to focus on? The preacher thought for a moment and then said, Well, there's an old story about a man. Yes, this is, this is like a nesting doll. There's a, a, an illustration within an illustration here. He says there's an old man a story about a man who wanted to serve God too. He asked God what is the one thing he needed to do, what he needed to do was, and God told him to go to a nearby village and push a giant rock up a hill. The man thought it was a strange request, but he obeyed and pushed the rock up the hill every day, rain or shine, for years and years. The young man looked puzzled and said, but what was the point? What did pushing the rock have to do with serving God? The preacher smiled and said, but you see, that was the one thing the man needed to do, and in doing it, he learned dedication, perseverance, and faith. And eventually, he realized that the rock wasn't the point at all. It was the process of pushing it that mattered. And that's how he served God, by dedicating himself to the task at hand, no matter how difficult or pointless it seemed. The young man nodded, understanding, uh, understanding dawning on his face. He said, I see. So it's not about finding the one big thing to do for God, but about dedicating ourselves to the small things and trusting that God will use them for his purpose. That preacher beamed, he says, exactly. And who knows, maybe someday God will ask you to push a giant rock up a hill too. But for now, focus on the one thing you know you need to do and do it with all your heart. And that's how we serve God. Dedication. <coughs> Putting God first in everything that you do. Everything. Every thought, decision, place. How are you going to dedicate your life to God today? We're going to sing here. Living for Jesus. That's what we need to do. Not live for ourselves. There's nothing you can do to get into heaven. It's all through Christ. And so we're going to live for Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's where it begins and ends. Let's be standing as we sing the song, Living for Jesus. Number 676.